our need, amazing grace going through this time, and recognizing the hand of God upon our lives, and to know that he is faithful, that he has us in the hollow of his hand, and uh, he is still good, amen. In spite of everything, the Lord is still good to us. Amen. He is faithful to us. He cares about his people. He loves us dearly. Yes. And uh, to know that he is altogether lovely and that he has a wonderful plan and purpose for our lives. Even during this time when, when everything seems topsy-turvy, but he is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah. And him being the same means simply this, that God is still good. Amen. And that his goodness is still available for his people that he still will take care of us as long as we're trusting in him, as long as we're deciding to stick with him, we know that the Lord will take care of us. And so that's what we're going to kind of go back into tonight. We're, we're been, we've been discussing uh, living in, in God's goodness. You know, God doesn't want you just to show up because you need his goodness. He doesn't want you to just come because you have a problem and I need, need him, you need him to do something. God wants us to live there. You know, we say that God is good all the time and all the time God is good. And I, my challenge to you is simply that if he's good all the time, then stay with the one who's always good. Amen. Never walk away from him. Never abandon him. Never just use him for problems. But he wants you to experience his goodness when nothing is going on. That's right. He wants you to experience his goodness in, in good times and in bad times. Okay. And that his goodness will never change. Uh, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And because of that, we can trust in him, know that he is faithful to us, that he is good to us. And above everything else, in the midst of everything, you can experience the peace of God. doesn't matter what's swirling around you. Like Jesus in a boat in the middle of the storm, you can find yourself fast asleep in a deep, peaceful sleep because the Lord is with you. Amen? Praise God. So we're going to pick back up again. And uh, we're going to look at Colossians chapter 3. Uh, this is what we kind of talked about last week, but we're going to kind of pinpoint some things tonight to kind of uh, uh, point out some things I thought is very relevant to us living in God's goodness. And so Colossians 3 uh, verse 1 says this. It says, since you were brought back to life with Christ, focus on the things that are above. And I want to look at that for a minute where he says, focus on the things that are above. You know, where you set your mind, where you set your mind has a lot to do with how you handle life. Where you set your mind has a lot to do with you experiencing uh, the goodness of God in your life. And so, you know, we want to just challenge you uh, in the goodness of God uh, to focus on those things that are above. Now, what does he mean by that? What does he mean when he says that we're to seek those things that are above? Uh, we've got to seek those things that are pleasing to our Father. Uh, he says that we're to focus on those things that we're to focus on those things that are above. Uh, where he says, where Christ holds the highest position. Now what does the writer mean when he says focus, or the word focus, I think the King James uses the term set, uh, set your mind on things above. Uh, the word set your mind on things above means this, it means that we're to look at life from God's perspective. That's the first thing we need to do. When we're setting our mind on things above, we're not simply thinking about going to heaven and, and getting out of here because of the trouble we're in. We're really focusing on the, the aspect of how, do I, how am I to look at things now through, through God's perspective, from God's perspective. That's the first thing it means to set our minds. The second thing it means, it means we need to seek after what he desires. And so you and I have to seek after the things that, are, that has the Father's heart, the things that are pleasing to him. Uh, we really ultimately are looking for his plan and his purpose for our lives and not our own. And so, so when we set our mind on things above, uh, we, should not, we should not be so consumed with what is going on in the world that we lose sight of what's going on in heaven. Amen. That, that there is something that God is always speaking to his people from heaven's, from heaven's perspective that will allow us to go through whatever we're going through right now with the coronavirus and all the ups and downs and the calamity that they're talking, the deaths that they're saying will follow. We can say to us, not at my house, praise God. Amen. But we can say, no, we'll not worry. Amen. We'll not be consumed by it. But we're going to be about the Father's business. And it doesn't matter, again, what, what, what is happening around us. Because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So it doesn't matter how, uh, what's happening. Uh, we, we, have to, we have to focus on the things that are above. We need to be heavenly minded. And again, I'm not talking about being so heavenly minded to, to where you know earthly good, where you're, you're only thinking about getting out of here, where you're only thinking about escaping, 
where you're only thinking about, boy, if Jesus would soon come. You know, uh, I'm talking about being heaven-minded in, in terms that you, you want to see this from God's perspective, not just from your perspective, not from a perspective of I'm tired, I'm weary, and I just, you know, I'm just ready to get out of here. The, that, that's a lot of times what the, we feel in our spirit that we don't like what's happening. But we are to always be looking at life from God's perspective, meaning what is God wanting to do right now, now that you are in this situation? I believe one of the greatest things that we can do is in this situ situation uh, with the virus and everything else, and where people are not going to work, where people are not, uh, they're, they're losing income, they're losing businesses. But at the same time, uh, we can, as believers, be assured that the source of our life is not this world. Amen. That Jesus is our source. Amen. And that he has purchased everything that we need uh, to have and experience God's goodness. Now, so, so that's what we want to do, focusing on the things that are above. And now, now here, l l listen to this. Um, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 31, he says this, and this is a very popular verse of scripture that I use a lot uh, here at Identify with Christ Church. But I think it's something that we honestly need to think about. Uh, we need to take it to heart. But in Matthew chapter 6, verse 31, this is what Jesus said. Don't ever worry. Don't ever worry. Now see, that right there tells us where we need to categorize worry. We need to categorize worry in the column of that which is not pleasing to God. Come on, man. He says, don't ever worry. And then he says, look, and say. So that means when you let worry, when you start speaking from a place of worry, you are not speaking faith. And the Bible said without faith, it is impossible to please God. So you've got to be speaking that which is in agreement with heaven. In other words, when we start speaking from the standpoint of worry, we are not seeing life from heaven's perspective. We are not looking or seeking after the Father's desires. We're solely focusing on how we feel and the chaos that may be surrounding us at this time. But God wants you and I to not worry. And he doesn't want us talking from a place of worry and anxiety. He, but Jesus says, don't ever worry and say, what are we going to eat? Or what are we going to drink? Or what are we going to wear? So notice that Jesus categorized these areas of our life, eating, drinking, and wearing. These are the things that people right now are concerned with. How am I going to pay my bills? How am I going to keep the lights on? How am I going to feed my family? But notice what Jesus said. Don't ever worry and say. What are we going to, going to eat? Or what are we going to drink? Or what are we going to wear? Look at verse 32. He says, everyone is concerned about these things. And your heavenly Father certainly knows you need all of them. Now notice here, he does not say God. I think this is very key. He doesn't say God knows what you need. He says your heavenly Father certainly knows, knows your needs. He knows all of them. And so you and I need to understand that we're not calling out to a God that we're not personal with. That as believers who have placed our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, God is not our God. He's also our Father. And every good father will always want to make sure that they provide for their children. And so he tells you, if God is good, then you don't have to worry because you can trust in the fact that in his goodness, uh, he will take care of you. Now, I know we don't like that because, you know, you know, people will always say, well, you know, but you have a human side. I hear that a lot. You have a human side. You have a human side. But let me tell you something. Yeah, that human side is called the flesh, and it's fallen. Amen? It's fallen, and it's not, it's not in an agreement with God. And the Bible clearly tells us that we're supposed to pose to bring this flesh under control. That we're not supposed to let this flesh dominate us. We're not supposed to let this flesh rule us. We are not supposed to allow this flesh to guide us. And yet, many times, we give ourselves a pass based on the degree of worry that we feel. And we chalk it up, well, that's just, I know we all got a human side. Yeah, we all, let's put it away, we all live in fallen flesh. But the Bible never condones us giving voice to our flesh. It never condones giving voice to our circumstances and conditions. We're to always give our voice to the Word of God and the will of God so that we can see from, so that we, so that when we look at these problems, we look at these problems from heaven's perspective. Come on, can I get an amen? I'll praise the Lord. All right, look what he says. He says, so don't ever worry and say, what, what are we going to eat? Or what are we going to drink? Or what are we going to wear? 
Everyone is concerned about these things. They're definitely concerned about them right now. He said, but your heavenly father, he makes it perfect. He didn't say that. He didn't say the heavenly father. He says your heavenly father. So he makes it very personal that God has a vested interest in you as his child. See, it's one thing for someone else's daddy to be good to their children. But it's another thing when your daddy is good to you. Amen. To many people, yeah, he's God who sits high and looks low, but is he your daddy? Is he your father? Is he intimate? That, that denotes a level of intimacy that you have with him. And if you don't know the intimacy uh, of your father with you, then you will question whether or not he's good to you. Because he won't come through the way you want him to come through. He won't bless you the way you think he's going to bless you. Amen. You're looking to the left for the blessing, and then he sends the blessing from the right. Praise God. You're looking around you for the blessing. The blessing falls and hits you on top of the head. God never blesses you in the way that you expect. But he always blesses you if you will just keep trusting him. Amen. Now, how do we trust him? Again, we focus on the things that are above. We focus on the things that are from heaven's perspective, and we focus on the things that are the Father's concern, that the Father's desires. That's the thing, that, those are the things as believers that we need to do. Give our attention to heaven's perspective and give our attention to that which pleases the Father. Praise God. The way he says in verse 33, he tells you, he, said, he says, no, don't be concerned about any of these things. And he says in verse 33, he tells you what you need to do as one whose faith is in the Lord Jesus. He says, but first, first, now he's talking about priorities here. But first, be concerned about his kingdom and what has his approval. Now think about that for a minute. He's, your first priority as a born-again believer, even now with this coronavirus, is to be concerned about his kingdom and what has his approval. Now, when he says to be concerned about his kingdom, what is he talking about? He's talking, when he uses the term kingdom there, he's talking about the, the kingdom system of operation. How does the kingdom function? How does the kingdom work? Well, the kingdom works based on faith, believing what God has said, and then following after what he's told you to do. And then he says, he says after he says uh, to be concerned about the kingdom, the Father's kingdom, but then he also said be concerned about what has his approval. Now, what does he mean when he says the Father's approval? He's really talking about the Father's standards. What has the, father, the Father's approval? That which meets his standards. So many times we do a lot of things in life that do not meet his standards. Do you know there are a lot of times that you, we can go to a job and uh, we can do the job the way we want to? We know we're not giving our best. Uh, in the job, and then when we get called on the carpet about it, we get offended. Well, you may have been meeting your standards, but you may not have been meeting the standards of the, of the company. And it is true with God, the Father. You may have standards you set for yourself, but they may not be His standards. Come on, amen. So many times we use our, our words, we use our actions, we use our thoughts, contrary to things that has His approval or His standards. There is a way of thinking. Let me ask you something. Do you think it, it, God accepts the standard of us saying, well, you know, we all have a human side. That's just how it is. He understands. And we keep rolling with the flesh. We speak, keep worrying out of our flesh. We keep speaking out of our flesh. Do you think that has his approval? Do you believe that that is the system of operation that the kingdom operates by? No, so we have to decide that we're going to operate according to the standards of, of God's kingdom, and we're going to do those things that holds to his standards, not our own standards. How many of you know that every time you live by your standards, your standards, will, your standards will always be lower than the Lord's standards? And we become satisfied with things that may not necessarily have his approval. It may not meet his standard. And then what he says here, verse 30, let me read it again. He said, but first, be concerned about his kingdom, or this, 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 his system of operation, and what has his approval, or what meets his standards, the way he says the, the, the benefit that that is, then all these things will be provided for you. Now think about that for a minute. Do we really believe that? Do we really believe that, that, that God, because you can't go to your job, do you believe that God can't, can't take care of you? If you can't, I don't have any income coming in, 
So you believe because you don't have any income coming in that God is incapable of providing for you. Remember, God has many ways to bless you that will, that will probably not be what you're looking for. But he'll still take care of you. And so we have to look at what Jesus tells us here. First of all, don't ever worry. He doesn't want us to worry. People say, well, you know, it's just human to worry. Then quit living by, by your human side or by your flesh and start living by your spirit. Now, people say, well, Pastor, that seems a little insensitive. Well, you know, my, my thing is this. I'm going to always give, not just you, but even myself, the high, to shoot for the highest standard that has God's approval. Now, I may, I may miss that standard at times, but I don't lower the standard just because I keep missing it. I keep shooting for God's standard. I keep aiming for his highest standards, that which has his approval. And I keep shooting for that. Hey, do, do I fall short? Absolutely. But I'm going to always get myself back up and keep shooting for his highest standard. Until that which, until that which I do is in agreement with him. You know, people say, well, you, know, you just don't understand. You know, but Jesus understands. And he still tells you to, to, to praise him. He still tells you in everything to give thanks. Because that's what the word, word of God tells us to do. But he says this in verse 34. Uh, he says, so, so don't ever worry about tomorrow. Now how many of you today, looking at your bills piling up, like all of us are probably looking at our bills kind of piling up, and, and, and we are worried about tomorrow. But look what Jesus, and this is Jesus speaking. This isn't just somebody else. This is Jesus, so we should take it seriously because he's supposed to be our Lord. He says, so don't ever worry about tomorrow. After all, tomorrow will worry about itself, about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And then what is Jesus saying? You got enough stuff to deal with in today, believe in me, than worrying about tomorrow that you might not see, that you don't even know is coming. So today has enough issues in it for you to look to deal with just today. That's why Jesus prayed. You know, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. He didn't pray about tomorrow's bread, the next week's bread, the next month's bread, the next year's bread. He said, give us this day our daily bread. And so you gotta, you got to learn how, and I know people don't like this when I say this sometimes, but sometimes you got to learn how to live in this day. can't worry about tomorrow. You can't, you can't do nothing about tomorrow. You worrying about tomorrow will not fix anything. But what you can do is you can manage today. Amen. Now look at Philippians chapter 4, and uh, we're going to look at verse, uh, verse 8. And here's what Philippians 4 says about our, uh, our thoughts and, and focusing them. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, keep your thoughts on whatever is right or deserves praise. Now think about this. Just that part right there. If you keep your mind on that which is right or deserves praise, would you not have a continuous praise if we did that? If we, if we did what this verse said, is to keep your thoughts, you know, on whatever is right or deserves praise. If we would do that, then the evidence of that in our life, if we would have a praise. When a problem shows up, guess what we'd break out with? A praise. You say, yeah, but you know, I don't feel it. A praise ain't about how you feel. Your praise is about, is about who you know is on the throne. <laughs> Come on, man. How many of you know that Jesus is on the throne? And to his kingdom there should never be an end. And no one will ever get him off his throne. And he'll rule and reign forever. If you know that, then whatever comes against you, you got to see that thing in the light of Jesus' position. If you look at a problem in the light of Jesus' position, you just know that's not a problem. Every time Jesus faced something that people didn't know how to handle, guess what? Well, he, he was the answer to the problem. We have the answer as our Lord and Savior. So anytime there is a problem, you got to look at the one who's on the throne. And as you look at the one who's on the throne, your problem, you discover, is not really a problem. It's just an opportunity to, for the one who's on the throne to show his rulership and his authority. Ooh, praise God. That's good, y'all. Amen. Our right, verse 8 says, Finally, brothers, to keep your thoughts on whatever is right or deserves praise. Things that are true, honorable, fair, Pure, acceptable, or commendable. Come on, amen. That's what he tells you to keep your thoughts. So, listen, if, so if we kept our thoughts in line with this verse, would we ever have a reason to complain? 
Think about it. If we kept our thoughts in line with this verse, would we ever have a reason to complain? Now, I know some people, well, you know, here's what people do. They always give me back this fallback word. Well, you know, ain't nobody perfect. Hold up now. That's not what we're talking about. Just a question. See, what you're doing is you're giving yourself an out so that you don't have to take to heart this verse. Just say yes, uh, amen. If, if, I, if, I, if I align my life with this verse, yes, my, my whole attitude about life would change because I would always have an attitude of praise. So we would not have a reason to complain about anything. And Jesus already said, don't ever worry and say. So worry, so worry has a voice. Worry wants to speak through you. When you get worried, guess what your flesh want to say? What are we going to do? How is this going to work out? I don't know how this is going to be done. Oh, Lord, help me, Lord. What, what, I don't know. I'm, I'm scared. That's what worry says. Worry becomes irrational. Amen. Praise God. But now look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 14. And again, Jesus said this. Don't ever worry. So don't ever worry about tomorrow. He tells you, don't worry. So Jesus himself commands us. He doesn't give you a suggestion as to whether or not you can choose to worry or say, well, you know, you got a human side. He doesn't say that. He says to us, don't ever worry. Don't ever worry about tomorrow. Now you say, well, well you know, you can't control, you know, sometimes you have feelings. You have, but you don't have to give voice to those feelings. See, Jesus said, don't ever worry and say. See, what you say gives voice, gives life to your worry. Sometimes you think, I say, Lord, you know what, I don't, I don't know how to fix this. But I'm trusting you, because I know you do. Come on, amen. But Philippians chapter 2, verse 14 says this. Do everything without complaining or arguing. Now, y'all see that little word, everything? It don't mean some things. God does not give you, as a believer, a license, listen, to complain about anything. You know why? You know why we complain? And I said we, I'm putting me in there too. The reason why we complain, because we take our, it, it is because we take our eyes off the one who is on the throne. That's why we complain. The reason why we argue about stuff is because we take our eyes off the one who is on the throne, who rules and reigns over it all. So, so listen, so why should we never complain but rather praise? Now this is Praise is our way of acknowledging the one who rules over everything. Let me say it again. The question, why should we never complain but rather praise? The answer is because praise is our way, the believer's way, whose faith is in the Lord Jesus. That is our way of acknowledging the one who rules over everything. So every time a problem shows up and I break out in praise, guess what I'm doing? I'm causing the one on the throne to take notice. Because what I'm saying to him, here comes Goliath, but here comes my praise. Come on now. And when I acknowledge him, then he align, He will fight with me to win over the thing that's coming against me. Because I've just acknowledged that he is greater than the problem. See, if the problem that's coming against you is greater in your mind, then you're, gonna, you're, gonna, you're not going to face the problem. Remember Goliath, how he came out before the children of Israel and taunted them for day and night, and nobody would go out to fight him, not even the king? Nobody would go fight him. But one little shepherd boy who believed in his God, praise God, decided to go fight him. Went down, had three smooth stones, three smooth stones and a sling. No armor, no shield, no sword. But all he had was a sling and some smooth stones against a man who was, who was skilled at war. Who came out there with a shield, full body armor, come on, amen, a huge spear. And David looked like he was going to lose this. But what they didn't see was that David had a testimony of how his God had delivered him from the bear and the lion, praise God. Then that he knew that God would also deliver a Goliath into his hand. And, and even testify that before day's in, I'm going to have your head on a spike. Now I'm sure everybody around him look, look crazy. See, your Goliath, our Goliath that we're facing right now for a lot of people is the coronavirus and not being able to go to work and being confined to the house and not having the freedoms you used to have. I always, but you know, I find funny, and I was thinking about this today. How many times did we have a job 
And we complain about having to go to the job because we really didn't like the job. But the minute we can't go to the job, now all of a sudden we want the job that we originally complained about. That tells you where your trust is. It tells you that you're trusting, you were trusting in that job. Because see, whether it comes or it goes, you got to know Jesus is still on the throne. If you look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, we'll read it again. We'll read the second part of that verse. It says, since you were brought back to life with Christ, focus on the things that are above. Listen to this. Where Christ holds the highest position. If Jesus holds the highest position, then why should you worry? Come on now. If Jesus holds the highest position, then why should we as believers who's trusting, whom we say is our Lord and our Savior, that word Savior means he's our deliverer, praise God. If, we're, if he's truly Lord and Savior, then why should we be worried about the coronavirus or any other problem or not being able to go to work and not having a check coming in? We are all in that same boat, but I have decided that I'm going to bless the Lord at all times and that his praise shall continue to be in my mouth. Oh, I may not feel like a praise, but my praise ain't based on a feeling. My praise is based on the one who I know is seated on the throne who reigns and rules over everything. And that has to become the perspective of the believer. Praise God. That has to become the perspective of the believer who says, you know, I, I trust the Lord. Nothing that comes against Jesus can win because he has already won. That's why he's seated. You know, when you gain victory, uh, you, can, you, are seated, you, you, you take a seated position. It is a resting position. And when you win, you can rest, praise God. But he tells us in Philippians chapter 2, verse 14, do everything without complaining or arguing. So don't give yourself, listen to me, church, child of God, quit giving yourself an excuse to complain, talking about, well, we all have a human side. Yeah, but greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And so you've got to, get, you've got to, you've got to let your spirit rise above your flesh. Now listen, in Hebrews uh, chapter 1, and, and this is another part we'll look at, that Christ holds the highest position. And I want to give you some verses that kind of acknowledge that so that you understand that it doesn't matter how bad it gets in the world, Jesus still holds the highest position. And if you're looking to the one who holds the highest position, then he's got resources that the world don't even have. And if he got resources that the world don't have, guess what? you got resources too. And so you can trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways you can acknowledge him and he will direct your path. He'll show you what you need to do. Sometimes he just said, he'll just tell you rest and trust me. I got this. Isn't it amazing? How many of you have had God bless you at times and he, he blessed you in ways you wasn't expecting? He came from, from directions that you weren't expecting him to come in. He blessed you through things and people that you were not looking for. He has, listen, God has more avenues to bless you, to provide for you, uh, than you can even imagine. And you got to trust that because he's seated on the throne, that Jesus reigns and rules. Now in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, and I'm, again, I want you to remember this, that your praise is your way of acknowledging the one who rules over everything. That's why we always pray, because for me to not praise is an insult to his position. Say it again. For me to not praise him is an insult to his position. He reigns and rules over everything. So if the coronavirus is getting me more worried that I am praising him, then I just made corona my God. But in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, here's what it says. It says, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors at many different times and in many different ways through the prophets. Verse 2, in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son. Now listen to this line. God made his son responsible for everything. If Jesus is responsible for everything, then that means he is also responsible for me. But here's the thing. I've got to give myself to the one, this is, who has made himself responsible for me. See, a parent can be responsible for a child. But if that child decides to run away and do their own thing, then that child has left uh, 
my home to where I can now no longer watch over them like I would have desired to. And so God uh, wants us, uh, through Christ, to be watched over, but we keep running away. We run away to the world, run away to the news, and listen to what the news is telling us. We run away to the government, hoping the government has the answer. Jesus is our answer. And he is on the throne, and he reigns and rules forever. And we trust in the Lord. And we don't turn to the left or to the right. We don't look for people to be the answer. Now, God can use people as an answer, but the answer will always come from the one who's on the throne. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look what he says here. He says, uh, after these verses, he says, In these last days he has spoken to us through his son. God made his son, referring to Jesus, responsible for everything. His son is the one through whom God made the universe. If God, can, through Jesus, made the universe, he can't make you any bread. He can't make you any finances. He can't make you any clothes. If he can make the universe, and he is seated on the throne, what do, you think he can, what do you think he can't do for you? You've got to conclude that for yourself as a believer. This is why it's important that during this time that we have this isolation and social uh, distancing and all this stuff, this is a good time to, 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 to draw away from people, but you can draw close to God. Get to know your Father. Get to know your Lord. Get to know your Savior, your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Draw nigh to him. Amen. If you draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. So he wants to have this intimacy with you. Now listen to this. Do we realize that today, right now, the God who rules on the throne is a man? Ooh, glory to God. The Lord Jesus was exalted by God to be the ruler over all. The Lord of the whole universe and the man Jesus is now on the throne over all things, people, planets, and everything. That's who's on. Your Lord is seated on the throne. The creator and maker through whom the Father made the universe is seated on the throne. Do you understand how powerful that is? That this is, this is where you as a believer are positioned right now in the Father. If Jesus is seated on the throne, and him being the head and we are the body, then guess what? We're seated with him. And we have, listen, remember I, I say this all the time, but that we, are, we were never created to be subject to the world. But the world was created to be subject to man. Come on, David said, what is man that thou art mindful of him? The son of man that you would visit him. You, you made him a little lower than the angels, but yet you made him. He said, look, the, the earth, the heavens are the, the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men. He gave you the responsibility of running the world. He would have done that had he not given you authority to do it. Praise God. In Philippians chapter 2, uh, verse 4, look what he says here. He said, don't be concerned only about your own interest. Because isn't that what's happening with this coronavirus? This coronavirus, it has revealed people's selfishness. People will fight you over a roll of toilet tissue. They will fight you over a bag of rice. How many fights have broken out because people are trying to mine, 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 mine? Selfish. What this, what this is doing it is revealing people's selfishness. Number two, if in the church and with the body of Christ, and I don't mean the building, I mean the people whose faith is in the Lord Jesus, it's revealing to you where you have placed your confidence. It really is. It, it is showing you that you really haven't been trusting in the Lord. Now, I'm not saying you particular. I don't know anybody in particular. But I'm saying it, it is re if you allow it, it will reveal to you the areas of your life where you're not trusting God. You've been trusting in your job. And you've been so comfortable with it that, that you have not even questioned God about going deeper into a relationship with him. And so you become comfortable and complacent. You know, a good, a good problem will shake people to reality again. It, it made them realize you need God. You need the Lord in your life. Because what you going to do now other than trust in the Lord? But when he says here in verse, uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 4, he says, don't be concerned only about your own interests, but also be concerned about the interests of others. And I said that before, this is a good opportunity for you to minister to people. You say, well, I can't get out. I can't go. Yeah, you know, but start a phone ministry. Amen. Call, uh, 
get a, a check check in on you ministry. You know, I'm just here to check in on you and pray with you. Encourage you. It, it's a good time for the church to encourage you. You may not be able to get together in the building, but you but come on, but through social media and the telephones, you can get together and talk and pray, talk about the word, and encourage each other. Amen. The way he says in verse 5, he said, have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Although he was in the form of God and equal with God, he did not take advantage of this equality. Now, what does that mean? It simply means that even though he was in this position of equality with God, he did not use this equality to do his own thing. He did not use his equality to say, you know, Lord, you do, God, you do what you do, I'm going to do what I do. No, he, he didn't do that. He didn't, take, he, didn't, he didn't try to use the authority that was given to operate and do his own thing. He came to do the will of his Father. Look at verse 7. It says, instead, he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant. What did he mean? He emptied himself of his own will. And here's, the, here's what many Christians have to learn to do. You must empty yourself of your own will. And, and, it is, and God will not force you to give up your will. The thing he told me many years ago, he said, Donald, he said, you must, you must be willing to empty yourself of your will so that I might feel you. And so if I'm not willing to give up my will and give up what I think, what I feel, well, I only have, I have a human size, so I have a right to speak out. No, hold up now. Oh, I got to empty myself of my will so that I can take on his will like Jesus did. And then and by emptying myself of my will and taking on his will, through his, me walking in his will, I will experience his provision. When I'm not even looking for it. <laughs> he'll just... Blessings come. In fact, he'll bless you before the problem. Sometimes he'll bless like every time, but sometimes he'll bless you before the problem ever show up. You think, why well, need this extra money for their bad? Come the problem. Oh God, praise the Lord. I need that to pay this. He'll do that for you. But it, but you gotta empty yourself of your will. That means you, you cannot you cannot try. Listen, here's the you cannot try to figure life out. Cause isn't that what we do? My God, is, is that not what we? I say we. I'm talking about me. I'm preaching to myself. Have we not spent years of our life trying to figure it out? When God said, I didn't, I didn't call you to figure it out. I called you to follow me. When they followed Jesus, they, they didn't, he didn't say, figure it out. <laughs> he said, no, just follow me. I'll take care of you as you follow me. Sometimes we just got to learn how to follow and just trust it. Amen. Through this corona thing, just follow Jesus. And this, do, you, do, you, do you not realize that the disciples that walked with Jesus, those 12 that stayed with him, do you know you, it is never recorded? In the time, those three and a half years that they were with him, that the, any of them ever got sick? Not one of them. You don't ever hear one of them getting going hungry. You never hear one of them not being clothed. In those three and a half years that they stuck with Jesus, he made sure that they were provided for. Even when Peter came and said, Lord, you know, they want us to pay, they want us to pay taxes, Jesus, you know, us, not just you, me, us. Meaning, I don't have no money. God gave up everything to follow you. So they want us to, so if I don't pay my taxes, you, I'm going to be in trouble with them. But they want us, Jesus, to pay taxes. And, he, and, he, and Jesus knew he was concerned about it. And what did Jesus tell him to do? He said, Peter, go down to the shore. Uh, go down to the sea, throw, like, throw in your net. The first fish that comes out. He said, uh, open up his mouth, and in that mouth you're going to find a gold coin. Use that to pay our taxes. What in the world? Now, don't tell me that's not some insight and revelation. But listen, but that same Jesus is seated on the throne right now. He can tell you where all your provisions are. And we, we, how, I mean, how many times have we racked our brain over something that God had already had it worked out? We just needed to wait. And we need to learn to wait with the praise. I tell people, before you get into worry, go into praising God, go into prayer, go start talking about, Lord, we thank you that you're the source, you're the provider of our lives, you got us, we trust in you, I'm not going to waste my thoughts trying to figure something out that only you know. I trust you, I know you love me, whatever you tell me to do, Lord, I'm going to do what you tell me to do, but in the meantime, the one thing you told me not to do, you told me not to worry about anything. And what, what am I doing? I'm acknowledging the one on the throne. So many times we only acknowledge God when we feel like we can't handle something. It's like God is the last resort. And that's not what he wants in our life. He wants us, he wants to be our first. He wants to be a, a God of first. So when, when something comes, comes up, the first thing he wants us to do is come to him. Say, Father, I, mean, I just need to ask you about this, but before I even do that, let me, let me just praise you for a minute. Let me tell you how wonderful you are. Let me tell you how awesome you are. Let me tell you how many times, let me remind you about all the times that you came through for me over the years. It's amazing we forget our testimonies when problems show up. 
I remember flu season came through many, many, many times. And I never got the flu. You know, so when this corona comes around, guess what I'm going to do? I want to take my testimony that all the other time in my life, when the flu came through, and I gave you praise, I gave you glory, and guess what? I never, I've never had the flu. I've never even had a flu shot. And I'm not, and I'm not encouraged. If you want to take a flu shot, I don't want the limit. Pastor said, don't take no. I'm not taking it. You do what you want to. I'm just saying, me and the Lord, I am, this is what he instructs me to do. If you feel comfortable taking your flu, then take your flu shot. I don't care, you know, because Jesus is still Lord, even if you take the flu shot. I'm just saying, I just never, never took it. And my doctor always said, oh, you know, it's flu season. I said, not in my house, it's not. Come on, I don't think my son's ever had the flu, and nobody in my house has ever had the flu. So praise the Lord. But what do we do? We trust the Lord with all our heart. We don't lay to our own understanding. If the Lord told me to get a flu shot, I take the flu shot in a heartbeat. Just never told me to. And so I'm not belittling anybody. If you take the flu shot, I'm not belittling anybody. If you take aspirin, I, I take aspirin too sometimes. But I'm saying, just when it comes to the flu, I've never had the flu, and I'm, I don't intend it. I do not intend for the flu to visit my house anytime within my lifetime. Amen. All right, Louis says here. All right, verse 7 says, it says, instead, Jesus emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, by becoming like other humans, by having a human appearance. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on the cross. See, is that, is that the place where you're willing to come to? A point of death? That you're willing to give? Are you willing to give up your life for the one on the throne? But I don't want to die. You don't, we don't die. <laughs> Believers don't die. We just transition. Come on, amen. Right now, we like we, we are living in, 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 a, in a, I call it caterpillars, a caterpillar Christmas. But amen, on the inside is a beautiful butterfly that's waiting one day to get out of here. But right now, we got to deal with this caterpillar called the flesh that we got to deal with. And nobody looks at a caterpillar and goes, ooh, that thing is beautiful. Nobody looks at a caterpillar and says, ooh, I'm kind of, ooh, step on it, you know. But the butterfly, oh, isn't that beautiful? Look at the butterfly, butterflies. Well, just, just, just a week ago, it was a, it was a caterpillar. But it went through transformation. So that's why I believe, we have to understand believers, we, even if to the point of death, we, we don't die. We just go through a metamorphosis. And we become what we were, we were intended to be from the beginning. Praise God. But look what he says. Verse 8 says, He humbled himself by becoming obedient to, to the point of death, death on the cross. Now listen to this. This is why God has given him an exceptional honor. The name honored above all other names. So God put the because of Jesus' faithfulness to the will of the Father, the Father has exalted his name, this is, above Jehovah. Now think about that for a minute. There's no other name that we operate in in this earth that's greater than the name of Jesus. And, and, this, and it wasn't, he didn't take that position. The Father gave it to him because of his faithfulness to be obedient even to the point of dying on the cross for us. My God, my God. But, but guess what? The one seated on the throne is experiencing, listen, is experiencing the goodness of God. And if he is experiencing the goodness of God in his position, should we not also be experiencing the goodness of God in the position we are in right now? Because we are, we are seated in heaven where he's seated. This it is. He said, this is what verse 9 said. This is why God has given him an exceptional honor, the name honored above all other names. So that at the name of Jesus, everyone in earth, in heaven, everyone in heaven, everyone in heaven, not just people, everyone, angels, everybody, everyone in heaven, everyone on the earth, on, and, and all of humanity, from, from humanity, humanity, humanity's beginning to humanity's end, on the earth, listen, and the world below. So every devil, every demon, every fallen and Every, everyone will, everyone will, will, in the world below will kneel and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God, you think about that position. This is the one that we call Lord and Savior. Who made, who through the Father, through, through Christ made the universe. And if he did that for Jesus, my God, my God, what can he do for us right now? I, I would challenge you to declare this over your house every day. No, no plague shall come now, my dwelling. Amen. Coronas ain't very. Here's my doorstep. It dies in the name of Jesus. 
And when I'm out in public, the glory, the goodness of God covers me. Amen. Again, I always say be responsible. Amen. But don't be fearful. Amen. You can do the natural things. It's like putting on your seatbelt. That's a natural. You don't do that in fear. You just put it on because that's what you're supposed to do. Uh, you know, you sanitize your hand. That's what you're supposed to do. But never let, let, never let it be fear that drives you to do it. Let it be responsible. Because that's the thing about being responsible. And then be obedient to God. Whatever God wants you to do. Do what the Lord says. Amen. Now listen to this. There is no other name that is higher than Jesus Christ. And there is no other name in which man can be saved except the name of the Lord Jesus, the man on the throne. Listen, if he is truly on the throne, then we must allow him to be on the throne of our hearts. Because even though he rules and reigns from heaven, he will not force a position of rulership over you right now in this world. In this world, you have the right to choose. One day, you won't have a choice. Everybody say, I'm not bowing to Jesus. No, you're just not bowing right now. But you go bow. And the Father going to make sure you bow. Because <laughs> it's to his glory. It's to the Father's glory. You know why it's to the Father's glory? That you bow to the, that everyone will bow to the name of Jesus. It's to the Father's glory. It's because the Father is the one who came up with a plan of redemption for all of humanity. And it was through Jesus Christ that that plan was executed. And Jesus faithfully served the plan of God for his life. And he was willing to die a horrendous death for all of our sins. And because of that, God is how they exalted him. And you know what Jesus is? Jesus is a reminder to us of the love that the Father had for us, that he was willing and, and sense to wrap himself up in flesh and come and give himself for a creation that was, that was his enemy. The Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ came and died for us. The Bible says we were enemies to him, and he still gave his life for us. That's why the God's going to honor the Son. And that's why it brings glory to the Father, because it is an indication that the Father's plan of redemption for all of humanity through the Son worked. And because the Son executed the plan to the degree that he was faithful to it, all the way to the point of death, the Bible said God highly exalted him. Amen. This it is. If he is truly on the throne, then we must allow him to be on the throne of our hearts. This is the only way the believer can have a lasting peace that surpasses all understanding. And I want to challenge you today that if you, you're, you're struggling with peace, I, I remind you as a believer, you must go to the peacemaker, the prince of peace. His name is Jesus. And if you will just learn to bathe in his presence, get to know him you will find that his presence will bring you such a, a blessed assurance. You know, we just sing that song, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Come on, amen. And, and if you would just learn to take the opportunity to get to know the one on the throne and the Father who executed the plan so that you and I could be redeemed, I'm telling you, you will experience the peace of God. This is a good time to spend time in the Word of God. Uh, I would say don't spend a lot of time watching the news media. They're going to tell you about everybody that's dying. Amen. Not people who's living. More people are living than dying. Uh, but I would encourage you to, to, to open up the Word of God and read those places where it helps you understand the, the position that Christ is in so that when you understand that, you'll understand the position you're in because your life is hid in Him. For in Him, or in Christ, we live and move and have our being. So I would challenge you today, find that place in Christ where, where you have a revelation of who he is and who you are in him so that you can live in the peace that, that God intended for you to have. So that we don't have to worry about corona or any other thing, but that we can live, be a people in the midst of this. Even when the bills are still coming in, we can still raise our hands and praise the one who is on the throne because he is the provision for our lives, that he has given us everything that we need for life and for godliness. Natural and spiritual. He's taking care of all of it. But if we don't go to him, then we may never see the provision that is rightfully ours. So I just encourage you in that today. I pray the word of God blessed you. I pray that you are encouraged by that, that you would uh, continue to grow and use this time wisely to spend time with the Father to get to know who he is in your life. Amen? Praise God. So let's pray and we will let you go. Hallelujah. Father God, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for your people. And Lord, we do pray that we will continue, even in the midst of all of this, that in the middle of the storm, Father God, we can still have a peace that surpasses understanding. We thank you for living uh, 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 in your goodness, Father, that we know that you care about us, that you have a wonderful plan, that you are the source and provider for our lives. And we celebrate the one on the throne, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. 
We love you. We thank you. And we give you glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.